All right, this is uh, me and a buddy of mine. James Glisson's house contains a lifetime of memories. Now this picture of my wife when she was young here, she, when she hooked me, you know. Most of them happy. This is where my crew called a barracuda. But others, reminders of the tremendous sacrifices and hardships of World War II. I was crying and praying that I'd come back home alive because so many got killed every day. I know God saved my life. That life began in 1926 in Sneeds, Florida, and it wasn't an easy childhood. We was real poor, and uh, a lot of times they'd pick on me. You know, I, uh, I wore patched overalls, and uh, my mother would patch them, you know, and to wear to school, you know. In addition to being poor, Glisten was bullied for being Native American, and going home wasn't necessarily a refuge. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, it was a scuffle to live. We lived tough, you know, and my father thought that uh, he was raised up tough as an Indian, so he wanted uh, to raise us up tough too, you know. So at the age of 17, Glisson joined the Navy. His training took him from Solomon, Maryland to Portland, Oregon, and then the attack on Pearl Harbor. The United States had officially entered the war. When I went to Pearl Harbor, the ships were still the uh, sunk ships and burnt ships and battleships and everything was lined up in Pearl Harbor. They were still there. Then orders came. Glisson was called to war. He was sent to Guadalcanal in the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese Navy outnumbered the U.S. and the battle was fierce. It went 24 hours a day. They never let up. They put one plane right after the other after you. And at night, it looked like the uh, stars from heaven had fall on you, so many bullets. As they neared Okinawa, planes began to attack. A ceasefire was ordered by the U.S. for fear of friendly fire but Glisson saw a kamikaze plane scouting a U.S. communication ship. Men were about to die. Glisson took action. So when he got up over us, he turned his plane to the right to go sink it. And uh, when he did, uh, I shot him down. I shot the whole cockpit away, and he crashed into the ocean. Forty-five sailors survived because of James. But there was no time to celebrate. As they neared Hill 89 on Okinawa's south side, the sights were horrifying. I was, I was scared I was going to get killed because out on the ground looked like he'd mowed the wheat. They'd killed so many Americans, you know, they couldn't bury the dead. They fought hand in hand for weeks right there at uh, Hill 89. And uh, the, the Marines and Army would just cover the ground with the dead. But what came next was shocking. Hundreds of Japanese people jumping up and down in the water. James realized they weren't trying to fight. They were hungry, sick. They needed help. Despite reservations from other sailors, he took two Japanese on board, an image that was captured in the July 8, 1945 Nashville, Tennessean. This is the first two Japanese soldiers I, I captured. And, uh, this one right here is the one that could speak uh, English good. He went to Tokyo University, and uh, that's a picture of me right there. Over the next days and weeks, the English-speaking Japanese and other translators helped James and U.S. forces capture approximately 80,000 Japanese men, women, and children, some who could have gone back to fight. Once again, James saved lives. This is a, when we started taking them in groups, you know, right here. These are all Japanese here, and this is taking them aboard. Somehow during all of this, James was able to build a life back home. He met his wife Lavelle in 1943 and for two years wrote her letters. When he returned, they were married December 31st, 1945. That marriage is blessed with five children, 15 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. James has lived a happy life since the war, but he will never forget those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. It's been a long life to remember it all, you know, but uh, 
I can't forget all the little white crosses on all them islands, you know. We're boys that didn't get to come home, you know. And there was plenty of them, you know. On every island, there's plenty of little white crosses still over there, you know. So that's the sad part. I have nightmares sometimes thinking about that. I'm lucky that I, uh, I got to come home, you know. <laughs>